going to wrap up our water unit by talking about a third type of pollution, um, focusing on some specific toxic compounds and different pathogens that can be in the water. So let's start with waterborne pathogens. So these are any kind of infectious disease organism that's found in water. So that could include bacteria, protists, viruses, parasitic worms, all kinds of different things. These are very rare in highly developed countries because a lot of the water treatment will remove most of these pathogens. But they're still major causes of death in those lo less developed countries because they don't have as advanced wastewater treatment. And in some cases, they just don't have access to a clean water source in the first place or um, a way to keep their sewage separate from their water source. So most of these waterborne pathogens are either spread through contaminated water, and in a lot of cases that's due to those poor sanitation systems um, or exposure to raw sewage, and in some cases that can also bleed into food handling as well because if you're washing your food with contaminated water, um, they're going to be traveling with that water. And then um, it can also come down to you not washing your hands often enough either because then you can have fecal matter on your hands that can have these pathogens in them. Now, in some cases, it's actually a vector stage that depends on water. So probably the most common of those is malaria. And malaria is an infectious disease that's caused by a protist. Um, and this little protist, um, you can see him right here, he likes to live inside of both humans and mosquitoes. So the mosquito is the vector that spreads this from human to human, but it's the protist that actually makes you sick, not the actual mosquito. So there's lots of types of diseases that spread this way, um, and mosquitoes are very common um, vector for these. Now, Lyme disease actually spreads in a similar way, but ticks don't breed in water, they breed on land. You've also heard of probably yellow fever, dengue, East Nile virus, those would all be similar um, types of diseases. And these are major problems worldwide, which it's really important to realize because we don't hear about it that much in the U.S. It's not as much of a problem here because we try to keep our mosquito populations under control. Now, when we start getting into some of the other pathogens, um, we start talking about things like cholera, which is called by, caused by this particular type of bacteria, causes severe diarrhea, vomiting, cramps, um, and in any of these diseases where you do have severe diarrhea, it can eventually cause hemorrhaging and severe dehydration um, that can lead to death if it's not treated immediately. So you can kind of see some of the places that this gets passed around in our water supply and think about some of the methods that um, might transmit this cholera. Dysentery, another similar type of disease infecting the colon. Again, a diarrheal disease caused by either the Shigella bacteria or certain types of amoebas. Typhoid, again, very similar um, in its symptoms, but this also includes um, feeling very weak, having a headache, having this particular rash, um, and again, it can cause hemorrhaging in the intestines if it's not treated. Hepatitis, certain forms of this virus, including hepatitis A, can be spread through water, um, but it is the somewhat less dangerous form of hepatitis. Um, when you take it in, in this method, it basically winds up in your liver and then that can lead to all of these symptoms that we see here. Um, and it's also possible for vectors to carry this disease as well. You may have heard of polio. It's another waterborne disease. Um, in this case, it can lead to paralysis and severe mu muscle atrophy. So you've probably heard of this in a historic context. Um, this was pretty much eradicated uh, within the last few years, especially in many countries, because there is a vaccine for it. However, because more and more people are becoming wary about vaccines, especially in this country, we start to see polio making a comeback in certain areas where people aren't getting vaccinated. Cryptosporidium is another infectious protist. Um, so whenever I see protist, I'm talking about a unicellular eukaryote. It's got a nucleus, it's not a bacterium, um, but it is still one cell. 
Um, and this particular produce can live out of water for quite a long time, so it's very hard to get rid of once it's in your water supply. It's also very small, and it can sneak through little gaps and filters and things like that. It's another diarrheal disease. It's one that actually pops up in the U.S fairly often and it has come up in cases in water parks um, and in public water supplies and the largest outbreak of a waterborne disease in the U.S. did happen with this particular protist in Milwaukee in 1993. Another common one sh uh, is schistosoma which is a type of fluke worm that infects the liver and the bladder and it has this snail vector that's actually living in the water where it can um, start to develop there and then when you swim in the water that's when it's actually able to get in and it literally goes through your skin um, and into your blood from there into your liver into your bladder so some of these things are pretty scary sounding um, and they're definitely not fun to have E. coli is probably one of the most occurring, uh, most frequently occurring waterborne bacteria. Um, and these bacteria are naturally occurring. They exist everywhere. They're in the soil. They're in the water. Most of them are not super dangerous. In fact, you rely on E. coli in your intestine to help you break down food. So normal E. coli are generally good bacteria. But some of these fecal coliform E. coli, um, which are coming from animal waste or from human sewage can make us very sick. Um, and there's particular kinds that are given these numbers, like this one, 0157H7, can make you very sick. Um, this comes from undercooked foods or things that have been washed with that contaminated water. So this is what we test for with our fecal coliform test when we test for water quality to see if it's safe for humans to drink. All right, so that sums up most of the pathogens that you should be aware of. There's lots more, but those are just some of the major ones that we encounter. Um, now let's talk a little bit more about some of the specific compounds in the water. So one class of compounds you need to know about are called volatile organic compounds, or VOCs. And you should remember from biology and hopefully chemistry also that organic compounds, there's anything that has carbon and hydrogen in it, they're usually found in either chains or rings. So for example, that would be sugars, amino acids, oils, anything like that. When we start looking at contaminants in water, most of the organics there that are contaminants are synthetics. So they're things that were put there that don't really belong in the environment naturally. Things like pesticides, solvents or other industrial chemicals, drugs, plastics, um, things like caffeine and different steroid compounds. So a lot of these compounds are very active in the human body and in the body of the organisms. Um, when we say they're volatile, that means they form a gas easily, and that also means that they're going to dissolve very easily. So they get dissolved in either the precipitation or the runoff, and then these can leach into the groundwater. And there's one particular class of VOCs that is very troubling called persistent organic pollutant pollutants or POPs uh, and these are persistent because they stay in the environment for a long time they don't break down on their own nothing really uses them up so once they're there they're very hard to get rid of and a lot of these are those endocrine disruptors that we've been talking about along the way in this past unit and in earlier in the year now the problem with these volatile organic compounds or persistent organic um, pollutants are, is that they are global travelers. They can travel around the whole world. Um, and because they're very volatile, they're going to evaporate very easily, and then they're going to move in the air currents, they're going to move with the weather patterns to different areas, and then they're going to be deposited, remember that whole deposition thing, they're going to be deposited back on the ground. Um, so this is going to follow the pattern of all our surface winds and those high and low pressure zones that's going to make them basically circulate all around the world. And then you're going to wind up with problems with these persistent organic pollutants coming up in areas that they might not even be being produced and, adding t and being added to the groundwater, but they may wind up there anyway. So there's 12 of these in particular that are very important to know, and they're known as the dirty dozen. And you can see that most of them are ring compounds, and it turns out that this actually, 
kind of causes a lot of their um, characteristics, like why they won't break down um, this particular structure. It also means that they look a lot like hormones and things like that in our bodies. Um, you'll see that most of them are actually pesticides, but some of them are either industrial chemicals or byproducts of industry. Um, and some of them have quite complicated names, so they've been abbreviated here. Now, once we get away from the organic compounds, we also have inorganic chemicals that can be very toxic. So these are not carbon-based. They don't have those carbon-hydrogen chains. Um, they're usually either an ionic compound like a salt, or they may be pure metals. So this would include acids, salts, heavy metals. These also do not break down very easily and are going to stay in the environment for a long period of time. And they can be introduced through many different avenues, but they do bi biomagnify and they tend to be very toxic to organisms. So when we talk about these, a lot of times we talk about heavy metals. And these are the metals that we're talking about in particular when we say heavy metals. These are the highly toxic ones. So metals occur in the environment all the time, but a lot of times these heavy metals are sort of trapped underground and by mining or by using these things in our products, we're now introducing that above ground where it doesn't really belong. So there are a couple of these that I want to focus on for a second here. Lead uh, being the first one, there are tons of different sources for lead. So it can come from paint. It was commonly used until 1978 and that was not long that long ago. So it's still in most houses in the US, at least three quarters or so are estimated to have some traces of lead paint. It used to be used in gasoline and that released lead dust into the atmosphere. And then once it's in the atmosphere, it can travel in many different directions to contaminate the soil in many different places, but especially anywhere um, that is near a highway or near an inner city, you're going to have high levels of this because this lead came from the gasoline that was being burned in these areas. Incinerator ash um, from burning different products that had lead in it also gets into landfills. There are factories that don't have pollution control measures, so they're releasing lead dust into the atmosphere. Um, it can be ingested from pesticides and fertilizers if you don't wash your food thoroughly. Um, your, some food cans are soldered with lead, although that's not as much of a practice anymore. And again, not as common anymore, but it used to be a part of lots of different types of dinnerware, a lot of the very popular um, plates and things that people ate off of. In addition, a lot of our pipes and our old plumbing systems and um, different municipal water systems were made of lead. And so that lead leached into the drinking water, leached into the water that we use in our homes. And in some places, they haven't been replaced yet. And then it does come from natural sources as well. Um, it can be found in windblown dust throughout the globe. It comes from volcanoes. So there is a lot of lead around us all the time. And when we start to have those levels of lead, you start to see very uh, significant impacts to human health. Um, you can see some of the statistics here are pretty scary. And you can look at all the places that lead might be coming from. So lead can have lots of different negative effects. These are some of the major ones here. So it can cause high blood pressure or hypertension, all kinds of birth defects, um, developmental effects, mental and physical impairments. One that's really interesting is this has been linked to much higher levels of ADHD. So that may be why we see more and more of that in society today. Um, all sorts of learning disabilities, but also behavioral things like it's been linked to higher levels of juvenile delinquency and higher murder rates in people who have been exposed to lead throughout their life. It causes all of these strange neurological effects. And it's really important here to recognize that this is an environmental justice issue because, as I said, a lot of that dust was in the air, especially near the highways and near the inner city. A lot of these uh, children that grew up in those areas are low-income children, and they're the ones that got exposed to the most lead. And then we see those effects in so many different aspects of life. It can affect them in how they learn. It can affect their test scores. It can affect how they behave later on in life. So this is truly an issue of environmental justice. 
um, by exposing these people to this lead. Now, when you really look at the numbers here, these are in micrograms per deciliter. Um, and you can see that anything above 10 micrograms per deciliter can affect your health fairly significantly in some cases. Um, so I want you to kind of visualize what this is for a second. A microgram is the millionth of a gram. A deciliter is a tenth of a liter, or about half a cup. So one way to think about this is if you think about a packet of artificial sweetener, something like Splenda or Sweet and Low, that weighs one gram. So there are one million micrograms in that packet. So if you think about amounts, try to think about that packet divided into a million different piles. And then you throw away most of those piles and you only keep 10. That 10 would be your 10 micrograms per deciliter. If you kept 80 of that million piles, that would be that serious damage to your health. So the, we're not talking about huge amounts here, but we, they can definitely have huge impacts. Another heavy metal you should know about is mercury. Most of the mercury in the U.S. is coming from coal-fired power plants, and we do have the technology to control the amount of mercury that's being released, but it's very expensive, and you still have to dispose of that mercury somewhere, probably in a landfill or something like that, which concentrates it all in one area, and it could still wind up getting into the ground supply. A lot of mercury also comes from our own household waste and medical waste, and one of the culprits is fluorescent lights and CFL bulbs. So even though these are built to be more energy efficient, they have mercury in them, and now that's a toxic substance to deal with. Um, thermostats, batteries, paints, plastics, thermometers, these all can have mercury in them, although a lot of um, industries have tried to move away from using mercury as much. Uh, when we're talking about coal burning in particular, they have put limits on how much mercury ha can be released. Um, and we've also looked at how much mercury we export to the rest of the world. And in 2008, e the EPA passed the Mercury Export Ban Act, and that governs mer how much mercury we can actually export, which it basically makes it mostly illegal to export that to other countries, and it also regulates how we manage and store mercury long term. So if you look at mercury emissions, you'll see that we have some relatively high areas here, but again, some of those highest areas are in those highest population countries. If you look in the U.S., you can see that Texas by far has the most mercury, um, but any of these areas that are darker here have very high levels of mercury pollution. And if you think about the amount of mercury that's actually being produced, about 48 tons from all of the U.S. Fire, um, power plants per year, and it only takes very little to contaminate the environment, you can really see the impact this could have. So part of the problem with mercury is it is the only metal that's a liquid at room temperature, and it's actually very easy to vaporize it at room temperature as well. So because it vaporizes, again, much like those POPs, it's going to get into the water um, very easily when it rains and things like that. And once it enters the water, its density makes it settle in the sediments on the bottom. There are bacteria down there that convert it to this methylmercury compound. And this is very toxic. It biomagnifies very easily. It's very persistent in the environment. So it's going to build up in those apex predators, a lot of which we eat, things like tuna, um, mackerel, anything like that. And the problem with methylmercury is it can actually cross the blood brain brain barrier. Most materials can't get from the blood into the spinal fluid in the brain, but this can, and that's going to be responsible for some of its toxic effects. So once it gets into your ecosystem and starts to biomagnify up the food chain, if it gets into humans, we can get severe kidney disorders, damage to your cardiovascular system, and again, major neurological problems. So this is that Mad Hatter chemical um, that used to be associated with making felt hats. Um, but it can cause lots of different psychological disorders, and again, tons of fetal development, birth defect disorders as well. All right, so we need to also address acid mine drainage. So whenever um, mining takes place, there are these tailings left over, which is basically the waste. And these tailings contain lots of heavy metals that weren't 
being mined and some sulfide compounds. And those sulfides, when they're exposed to water, um, turn into sulfuric acid. And that sulfuric acid eats away at the rock and it dissolves everything in it. And now you have those heavy metals that were in there leaching into the surface water along with that sulfuric acid. So you have very acidic, very toxic water that's washing in. And when you have a large rain event or when the snow melts in the spring, you get these toxic pulses that can kill everything in the rivers or lakes that are nearby. So this kind of just summarizes that process again. And the, this acid mine drainage is so toxic for a couple of reasons. Um, the acidity lowers the pH level of the fish's cell, and that affects how much oxygen it can actually take up. So if it can't take up enough oxygen, it can't do cellular respiration, it can't get energy. Um, then those metals also enter and disturb it as they bioaccumulate, as we've talked about before. One last class of substances we need to talk about are the radioactive substances. So these have atoms of unstable isotopes that are breaking down, and as they break down, they emit radiation in different forms. And this is going to be coming from any kind of mining of a radioactive substance, and these are used for nuclear weapons and nuclear power plants, um, or it can also be something that has escaped from a nuclear facility. They also tend to concentrate in sludge, and in some cases they're used in medical treatments like radioactive iodide or radiation therapy for cancer. So you do get exposed to a fair amount of radiation in your daily life, and you can see some of the different levels here that you'd be exposed to through different things in your life. Um, but in some cases, your radiation exposure is going to be much higher because of where you are and what has happened in that area. If we start looking at um, the ocean in particular, we can see levels of natural ocean um, ra background radiation, and then you can see how that is affected by different events like nuclear weapons testing or the meltdown of Chernobyl or Three Mile Island. There was a recent meltdown that you should know about at Fukushima, Japan, that was caused by the tsunami in 2011. And this caused a nuclear fallout that reached over the Pacific Ocean and into the US. Um, and what happened here was basically that when the tsunami hit, it caused the meltdown of this power plant. And then a lot of these radioactive compounds released into the environment. So they got up into the atmosphere, and then they will come down with the precipitation. They got out into the ocean water right along the coastline where this was. They got into the nearby rivers and then ran off th into the groundwater and into the ocean. And then they also were in the underground water as well. Um, so we could actually detect this in the US. Um, you can see higher levels of radioactivity that were a result of this, especially along that Southern California coast. Um, and if you really start looking at a lot of the organisms here, you see that we have much higher levels of radiation that w than what we would normally expect with a natural background rate. One more thing I wanna address is when we burn coal, um, there is some toxic ash that is left over from that. So this would be basically whatever's left when they burn it. And most of it is not very bad for you. It's inert, which means it's not going to react to it very easily. But a lot of it can contain heavy metals. Um, sometimes this coal ash can be reused in things like Portland cement, but a lot of times it's just stored in these piles or ponds, and then eventually it will be brought to a landfill and covered up. So this coal ash can also get into the groundwater. You can also have those severe weather events that flood these pools, and then you can get those heavy metals leaching through the groundwater as well. So one particular case of this was at the Kingston Fossil Plant in eastern Tennessee, which is a huge power plant. And in 2008, they basically lost 7 million cubic meters of this coal ash into the surrounding area. The heavy rains flooded the pools, and it spread out in a massive toxic flood. Um, and that caused high levels of thorium and lead in the area. So, of course, those heavy metals are going to cause human health effects as well. It also damaged several houses um, by literally flooding them. And it 
significantly decreased the biodiversity in the area, covered the vegetation, caused a high turbidity level in the water. Um, it caused death of many different organisms in the surrounding area, and it may wind up causing very high levels of cancer and other things as well in humans. So from here, we need to talk more about um, how to prevent this pollution in the first place and how it gets regulated. And we also are going to focus on, OK, once it's already there, if we haven't prevented it, now what do we do to clean up or rem remediate that area? So that's where our super fun sites and things like that come into play. So in our next couple units, we're going to talk more about that and more about all of these toxins. Um, so next unit is land use, and we'll be getting into some of that soil contamination there and also some of the cleanup processes like landfills and things like that. And then after that, we follow it with air and energy where we'll talk about how some of these tie into air pollution as well. And that'll round us out for the year. All right, so come in next class prepared to talk about these toxins and particularly how we're going to regulate them or how we are currently regulating them. And then that will wrap us up for our water unit this year.